Welcome into the MBFC First and Gold podcast. I'm Kelly Burke, and joining me today is someone very familiar with Valley football. Coach Grant Olson is a former All-American linebacker at North Dakota State, turned linebackers coach at Indiana State, and he is also husband to the former Amy Anderson. Coach, uh, welcome to the show. How are you? I am doing well. Thank you for having me. It has been over a year now since you've joined Coach Mallory and his staff in Terre Haute. How have the last 15 months, you know, fundamentally changed you? Oh, I think that's a great question. One, I've learned a lot. Um, you know, we, we came together as a staff. We're kind of a hodgepodge of different guys from different areas. You know, we didn't come as one entire staff, you know, like, like sometimes happens when a, uh, when a head coach takes over a new program. So that wasn't us. So it took us as a staff uh, just a little bit of time to just learn a little bit about each other and how we were going to operate. It was Coach Mallory's first time being a head coach. So it, it, uh, that was something that was really interesting. I've learned an lo awful lot from every coach on staff, just about good ways of doing things and different ideas. So that's been really cool to see. And I think that we as a staff have all improved and made each other better coaches by coming together. So that's one of the first things that just as a, as a individual coach, what, uh, what has been a great benefit to, um, uh, to me. But then we've also now just come together as a team. We're now on the same page going into our second year. You know, I can just speak to the linebackers and the defense that I watch so much is our guys know what they're doing. They're so much more comfortable and confident in our schemes and our practice routines and everything we do. It's night and day from last spring to this spring, from last summer to this summer. So I'm already really excited. We're going to be a much improved football team this fall. In the last 15 months, how have you seen the culture change at Indiana State? Well, I think the first thing is that every time that you go through a culture change or a coaching change is buy-in. OK, and especially for older juniors and seniors, they've been doing their thing with a different coach for a while. It can be hard for those guys to buy in right away. I don't care where you are. Every coaching staff goes through that. So seeing our older players now being completely bought in, that's been the biggest difference because those are your leaders. Those are the guys that take the freshmen and bring them along. Um, so seeing a guy like a Cottrell Moss who's going to be a senior middle linebacker for us this year. He's done an incredible job of leading and he's been injured lately. But seeing him transform and just become a, an even better leader than he already was. So it's guys like that that, that are going to take this team from where we were to where we're going. So that's been really cool to see. What kinds of things did you do with those upperclassmen to earn their trust and to build that re mutual respect factor? Well, I think the first thing is... Uh, you know, talking to the guys and just all getting on the same page and saying, hey, everybody here wants to win. Let's first agree on that. The second thing I think we all agree on is that uh, we're here for Indiana State. OK, and if I'm willing to work hard and you're willing to work hard and then from there we treat each other with respect, we'll probably have a pretty good relationship. And that goes for everybody in our program. That's just a, a, a rule that we all abide by. Everybody treats everybody with respect. So so from there, anybody that's willing to work hard automatically gains trust and confidence in everybody else around them. So as a coach, that's my job. You know, I know those guys need to see me working hard at practice and working hard, watching film and doing those things. And the same goes vice versa. So I think all of us coaches just coming in working hard, giving great effort, and then um, and then just spending time with guys has allowed them to trust us, to get to know us on a more personal relationship. And from there, that's helped the players buy in. So I think that would be the most important thing that we've done. I was reading about how you've made a number with, with the strength and conditioning staff changes nutritionally. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you've re remade the office over. What are some of the specific things you as a staff have done um, to and implement it off the field, you know, to produce that winning mindset. Gotcha. Um, you know, that, that's that's a great question, and I don't know if in in college football there's one perfect answer on how to create that because there's a bunch of teams doing it a bunch of different ways, and all of them are having success doing it. Um, I, I think the biggest thing in terms of creating that winning culture or that attitude is, is one obviously preparation. OK, if we're not going to put the time in the weight room, we know we're not going to be successful. So that was the biggest thing or one of the biggest things that we've done as a staff is getting improving the nutrition, improving the weight room, doing that. So now all of a sudden our guys are confident and they're saying and they're looking and saying, hey, Coach Mallory has done everything in his power to give us an opportunity to be successful. Now it's just up to our guys to work hard. OK, so I look at it and say, hey, linebackers, we've given you the weight room. We've given you the nutrition. Now it's on you. 
Okay. And they've looked at that and said, well, if these coaches are going to bust their butt giving me opportunities, well, I better bust my butt in the weight room. So that it's kind of, it started with Coach Mallory and it's gone down to our players. So that combination has done just drastic things for us. And like you said, we've had incredible improvements in our strength numbers, our bench press, our squats, our cleans, all those things are just our body weights. Um, so anyway, so all of that's been really positive, but, but that's where it started in terms of getting the weight room and the nutrition right. And, and then the players have just taken it from there. As a coach, how do you teach physicality and toughness? That's a great question because I think it's one. It's, it's definitely one of those things where some people just definitely have it more than others. You know, that's something that I'm going to look for in the recruiting process. Some people just like to hit people. They like <laughs> contact. They love the game of football. And some people like the game of football but don't love it. Um, so I think that's kind of the first thing. But But then now that we get them, how do we develop it even more? Part of it is just making them go through really tough things, okay, and then talking to them about it and saying, hey, you know, we're doing we're doing a one-on-one drill, tight ends versus linebackers. Everybody's watching. There's a winner and there's a loser, okay, and letting the whole team see it and, and finding out who's the tough guy that's going to compete and who's going to go win that one-on-one matchup for you. So just doing as much of that as possible and giving guys opportunities both to thrive and also to fail. You know, there's been some failures that have been some big time teachers for some guys. And then guys have taken that failure, learned from it, come back, and then they've done better and improved. So just not being afraid of some of that stuff and putting them in difficult situations, I think, helps continue to cultivate a mindset of being tough, um, nasty, physical, all those things. What was the moment you realized that you wanted to be a college football coach? Oh, that is a good question. Uh, for me, it's someone I always really enjoyed. I would even go all the way back to maybe my dad coaching me in new sports and just having a great bond and relationship there. Um, I grew up just loving every different sport possible, and I, I was fortunate to have some great coaches. So then moving into high school, I had a couple of awesome coaches there as well that really um, just motivated me and taught me a lot, made a big impact on me as a, as a young man and as a football player. Um, and it was just something I enjoyed. And I said, you know, I, I think I got a little bit older and got into college and was kind of sort of trying to figure it out. I knew it was always in the back of my mind. But uh, but as I really got probably my junior, senior year of college saying, you know, I, I really could see myself doing this and having a lot more fun than than being an engineer or whatever else I would have done. <laughs> yeah. so I would probably say it probably my junior and senior year of college is really when I made the decision. It was funny because my head coach at the time, Coach Craig Bull. After after he left, he kept calling me back and saying, "Are you sure you want a GA? Like, when are you going to graduate?" And I'm like, "Well, next winter, coach." And he's like, "Okay, well, just keep me in mind, okay?" And I said, "I will." So anyway, that's kind of how I ended up out there, and, and it worked out pretty well for me. Nice. Defensively, where do you feel like you, as a team, made the most strides during spring ball? Uh, definitely. Where we made the most strides, I would say that we have made the most amount of strides in just being on the same page. Compared to last last spring, compared to this spring, it's now the second year that we've run the same defense, the same calls, the same communication. I just look at guys like a Jonas Griffith or a, uh, a Noke or Jamal Jones or um, just a, a lot of the guys, all the guys that returned that all played last year it's noticeable how much better they are because, like I said, they're confident, they know what they're doing, and they're so much better prepared. So then all of a sudden you go from teaching the basics to teaching the to the intricate details of everything, and now all of a sudden you're seeing guys going out and just having fun. They're not thinking, they're just playing, and that's been by far the biggest thing because now all of a sudden they just get to go out and play football, and they let their natural athletic ability take over. As I mentioned in the introduction, you were an All-American linebacker at North Dakota State. So speaking from experience, what makes a great linebacker? Well, I think the first thing, and this is what we're looking for in recruiting, is is the first thing is just somebody that loves the game of football. You know, you you can't play linebacker, in my opinion, and not absolutely love the game of football, love to compete, love to put your face in there and hit somebody as hard as you can. If you don't have those qualities, football is not for you. You know, you should should (laughs) think of a different sport. So that's the first thing. Um, uh, The second thing that I'm looking for is just people – that um, in terms of it, whether it's their mentality, but just just some football IQ. I think that kind of like being, you know, we're the quarterbacks of the defense in a lot of areas. So guys that are um, able to to learn and recognize 
uh, formations and tendencies and to communicate. So I, I think we're definitely looking for that all the time. And then after that, obviously, athletic ability. You know, every football uh, position is looking for athletic ability. Um, linebackers wise I'm looking for guys that can kind of do it all and that's what I enjoy about the position is you, you know you're involved in the run game you're involved in the pass game and you're asked to do a lot of different techniques um, and I, I'm just I can't stand not being involved in something so guys you know it's kind of like you know it's the basketball player that demands the ball in his hands you know it's the guy it's the baseball pitcher that wants to be the closer it's that guy that wants to be in the crunch situation whatever he's doing those are the type of linebackers that I think we're looking for do you ever get in there at practice and mix it up with the guys? And you know, when you when you feel the need to get a get a hit in, <laughs> only when they're not looking. If somebody's not looking, and I can get up underneath them and just shove them a little bit, and then I got and then I better blow my whistle and stop the drill. Um, <laughs> but no, I usually they they beat up on me a little bit. They love it if I'm if I'm being the blocker, if I'm being the dummy. I know guys are always going to take an opportunity, give me a little extra nudge, maybe try and knock me off balance. Something along those lines, which is okay. We have a lot of fun doing it. But uh, but anyway, no, I try to stay out of the way. I don't want to get hurt. So. <laughs> Probably a good call. My, yep. my, my conversation with Coach Grant Olson continues in just a second. But if you're enjoying this edition of the MVFC First and Gold podcast, check out all the lineup media group offerings, sports and non-sports podcasts. Now back to the show. You briefly touched on Coach Craig Bull, uh, yep. who was your coach at North Dakota State back when you were a player there and is now the head coach at Wyoming, and you coached there with him for a season. What specifically did you learn from him? I think, well, it's hard to say one thing because I've learned a lot. You know, I spent I spent seven years with the guy between playing and yeah, coaching yeah. and uh, and just have a tremendous amount of respect for him. But uh, if I just had to pick one, I think the biggest thing that I took from him is that um, the, the best way for a linebacker to become a really good linebacker is to be out on the practice field practicing the position, to be in the weight room lifting weights, and to be in the position meeting room getting corrected by watching film. And I really appreciate about Coach Bull. He wasn't a big speech giver. You know, he didn't spend 15 minutes at the end of practice giving some motivational speech. He wanted those linebackers to be coached by the linebacker coach, and that, and he knew that was what was going to make them better. He wanted the running backs practicing the running back position, meeting with the running back coach, and on and on. So just his mindset on repetition and how to improve, because just like the same thing we are here, we're a developmental program. You know, We're not getting five-star recruits here, and that's okay, but it's our job as coaches to take maybe those two, three-star recruits and develop them into five-star recruits. And just seeing how he did that in his mentality, I think, was the biggest thing that I took from him. You were a part of three national championship teams uh, in, at your time in Fargo. Looking back now, how have those experiences and successes of those teams, how do they continue to impact you? Oh, that, that is a great question. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. Looking back on those teams, I think one of the biggest things that I've noticed is all those guys that played, whether some of them are still in the NFL, some of them are coaching, and some of them have their own private businesses now. I can tell you to a T who's successful and who wasn't. Okay, and it was the guys that did everything right, that gave the football team everything that they had, the sacrifice for their teammates, that were very coachable. Every single guy I played with that was like that has turned into a success. Some of them are engineers, some of them are accountants, some of them are doing who knows what. But every one of them has turned out to be successful because of what they did as a football player. And that's one of the things that I look back at now and I'm really thankful because I've got a phenomenal group of friends and people that I know I can trust and count on. And I look at now as a coach and I can guarantee you Cottrell Moss is going to be ridiculously successful in life no matter what he chooses to do because of how he goes about his business. He works his butt off, he's coachable, and he cares about other people. And those three things I know are going to translate to any job. I, I've told him several times, I will go to any job interview you want. And I will get you a job because of what you've done for this football program. And I really appreciate it. So um, so anyway, so that's probably the biggest thing and that I've tried to relate to these guys. Because every, every linebacker that I've got, everybody on this football team will eventually be done playing the game of football. And we as coaches all want them to, to be very successful. And it's no like, you know, we, we could we could pinpoint, we could close our eyes and easily tell you who's going to be successful later on in life based on how they are as football players for us now. Um, 
So anyway, I'm really thankful we've got an awful a lot of guys like that on our football team at the moment, and they've been great leaders for us. That's interesting. That's, uh, I mean, it, it, you're right. It's a great predictor of, of future mm-hmm. success. Oh, it's it, it is it's funny. It's been from, from what I've seen going from when I played till now. It's been it's been about a hundred percent. If it's not a hundred percent, it's ninety five. It's awfully close. <laughs> so, so anyway, that that I think is something that people maybe don't understand or overvaluate. So many people are looking at you know how tall are they, how fast are they, on and on, and that's great in terms of the game of football. But in life, which is a heck of a lot more important for these young men, is developing them and allowing them to go out and be successful and really positive members of their community. It's the guys that don't show up late. It's the guys that take care of their business academically. It's it's the guys that are coachable and put the extra time in. Every one of those guys on our football team, I know who's going to be successful. And I'm really hoping those other guys are going to learn from them and to be able to take those things and hopefully they can improve and grow. Um, but uh, but that's, that's, like I said, I think the – the takeaway um, from a lot of those national championships is we weren't always the biggest team. We weren't always the fastest team, but we had the most amount of guys every single game that did stuff right off the field. And it translated to on the field success. How have you and the staff had to adjust your communication style? Because, you know, for, for you and someone like myself, the way we communicated in college and it wasn't that long ago for both of us, but yeah. it still was a lot different than how college students and football players and at student athletes today communicate. You know, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, and, and I'd be even curious to hear your thoughts on it. But I, I am a firm believer that there are a couple tried and true principles in life that will always lead you to be successful with a young man in terms of coaching him. And the first one is respect and the second one is honesty, okay? If you look a man in the eye or a lady in the eye or whoever and you tell them the truth and you say it in a polite manner, odds are you're probably gonna be successful. And I think that's been the case for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, but in terms of some of the media, in terms of coaching and how they learn, I think some, I think today our, our kids are a little bit different in the fact that they might not want to have a playbook. You know, how many places now have iPads instead of textbooks? And that's where I think the challenge for us maybe is coaching in, in terms of creative ways to teach. I think that's probably more the hardest thing. Um, and just keeping their attention span and then also finding new creative ways that are fun and engaging to them. You know, so if there's any way that I can find to make a video playbook, I know they're going to appreciate that more than if I print something out. Um, so that's been a challenge for me and for us. And I think every coach in the country is going through the same thing. So have you made a video playbook? I haven't. Well, we've got a lot of cutups that we've made. So okay, I've got a, okay. I've got a library of plays that I've kept and said, OK, guys, here is a great example. And I'll highlight it and say, hey, watch Griffith on this play. This is a perfect technique. OK, instead of me sitting up there and describing it. Hey, here's a video of exactly what we're trying to do. We're going to go drill this today just so you guys know. And they say, okay, great. I see that now. Or maybe it's a coverage or whatever the case may be. So that's where I know I'm continually trying to add and make sure I've got a repertoire of drills and video that I can show these guys at any time. Uh, Coach Abrams is the best ad in the country. Coach Abrams got more plays and more clips than anybody I've ever seen. Really? And- yeah, and in situations and stuff. And I love his meetings because he's our special teams coordinator. I love going into yeah. his meetings. I learn about the game of football every single time I step into one of his meetings. So, you know, and, and maybe it's NFL clips. You know, maybe it's high school stuff. Maybe it's, you know, talking about and explaining rules, you know, goofy situations. So all that stuff I think our, our kids enjoy and appreciate, you know. Like I, it's, would they rather watch – me making a tackle or Ray Lewis doing it? Well, most kids would probably say Ray Lewis. So if I can find a clip of Ray Lewis doing something great, I need to show it to those guys. So anyway, and I'm, I don't have all the answers there. You know, I know plenty of coaches are doing great stuff, but that's what I know um, some things that we're looking at and trying to do a better job of. You mentioned Coach Abrams. One part I found particularly interesting about your staff, Coach Abrams, he's the dedicated special teams coordinator, and he that's his – main and only job and you don't typically see that especially in fcs programs how much of a difference do you think that's made in this past season for you especially when you have a kicker like jerry yep no that's well i I, i've never been a program where you've had a guy that's completely dedicated to special teams so seeing that for the first year i've learned a lot and, and I think it's a phenomenal idea. Uh, again, not every program is able to do that. They might not have the resources, but he's been a tremendous asset to everybody because 
nobody else has to do it. That's one of the first things, you know. I don't have to step away from a defensive meeting with Coach Wilson or Coach Smith, and we're talking about, you know, maybe how to fit a certain run play. I don't have to step away for that for special teams, and nobody does on offense either. So just by having him, our offense and defensive staffs are so much better. And then on top of that, he does have a lot of time. He can nitpick things, and he can be so much more detail-oriented than another coach could who's worried about the running backs or the linebackers or the tight ends or on and on. So um, I think he does an incredible job. The notes that he prepares, his meetings are thorough. They're on point. The kids get the notebooks, and they get the feedback that they need. Um I, I've seen I've seen it as a tremendous success. Our practices run really smooth. He does a great job organizationally, um, and then it also allows us to be really diverse schematically. We've got more time, and he's got more time, so we've just got a lot of adjustments and things that previously at other places that maybe we haven't always had because that's what he's dedicated to. So um, I think he's an incredibly valuable member of our staff in that aspect, and he's done a great job with the kids. I think they absolutely love playing for him. You won a lot of games when you were a player at North Dakota State. And yep. in terms of not winning a game for the season, how did that test you guys as a staff? Because you obviously, and the staff knows, and you saw every day the improvements going on behind the scenes, but it wasn't necessarily translating into the win column, you know, to outsiders. Gotcha. No, that's a, that's a great question. I think uh, so – one of the biggest things that I learned is how Coach Mallory led the staff and the team. And the first thing that I know he did was he's been a part of different staffs where all of a sudden when the team's not doing well, it's very easy as a football team to become divided. All of a sudden the offense blames the defense or the defense blames the offense and everybody blames special teams and on and on. And when you're losing and you're not having success, it's easy for that to happen. I don't care what you're doing, you know, it happens with guys on the staff. It happens with guys on the team. And, and he set a standard of, guys, we're not doing that. We're offense. You guys aren't going to blame the defense. Defense, you're not going to blame special teams, on and on. Everybody's going to take responsibility for their action and do the best they can to improve it. And starting from the head coach and then working our way down from the coaching staff to the players, I think that allowed us to, to stay together. And that was critical for us because we very easily could have said, hey, we're on five. Well, too bad. Like We're not going to work hard anymore because our season's over. And that's not what we did. I know we were 0-10, and, and we came out and practiced like we were 10-0, and 0 and we worked our butt off. Okay, And I appreciate that so much about Coach Mallory, the other coaches, and our players. And there's an awful lot of places in the country you wouldn't have had that. And, yeah, nobody wants to be 0-10. Like I know I've, I stood up there a couple times in front of the uh, position group and said, hey, guys, just so you guys know, I don't want to be 0-10 either. I don't think anybody in here does. Well, that's where we're at. So what are we going to do about it? So, and that, and that message was echoed across the entire team. Um, so, so that was a big reason I think that our kids continue to trust us and continue to work hard as they saw as a coaching staff. One, we didn't, we didn't fall apart and we continued to work our butt off for them. And, and I think they appreciated that and respected that. It's definitely something that I appreciate about and respect about Coach Mallory. Uh, I had your mm-hmm. guys' game, the season finale, when you were in Cedar Falls taking on Northern Iowa. And I was yep. really taken aback in a good way just about how yep. even keeled he was when I had to interview him at halftime, you know, and you're facing a big deficit. And I think, as you said, it permeates down to the staff and to the mm-hmm. players. Absolutely. Um, yeah, shoot. I mean, he, he set the tone in terms of how we're going to handle adversity. And, uh, and you know, yeah, the you know the season's over and we went 0-11, but I sure know that we learned from it. And we are a much more mentally tough and resilient outfit than we were at this time last year just because we went through some hard times. And I know I told some guys, like, guys, it's really easy to show up to a place that does nothing but win conference championships or whatever, you know, at any level, in any sport. It's easy to do that. It, it takes a special person to go 0-11 and just to keep coming back for more and to develop that mental toughness. And when we w- start winning a lot of games next year, it's going to mean so much more to us because of what we went through last season than anybody else in the country. I can honestly tell you that, and I'm really excited for it. What's been the biggest aha moment that you've had from being a college football player to now a college football coach? Probably, I, I, w- I would say that one of my biggest aha moments would be now understanding where some of my coaches' frustrations used to take place. I think that's <laughs> something that it's like, 
all this, you know, because you're you're as a player and you're maybe in your position rooms and it's like, man, you know, man, why is coach just so wound up about this drill or why is he so detailed about this thing? Like it, it doesn't matter. It's not that big of a deal. Or and then also now as a coach and you see you see things from a bigger picture and it's like, OK, now I understand why coach was so obsessed about these tiny little details or why this terminology matters so much or on and on. So I think just gaining an appreciation for how hard it is to teach somebody else the game of football and why you need to be so detailed and so uh, obsessed about little things has probably gained – I've gained an appreciation for my former coaches. I'll just leave it. <laughs> so what are your some of your – pet peeves now as a coach oh shoot my i would say my pet my my two pet peeves would be one um just a lack of football iq just an utter lack of football iq is a giant pet peeve of mine because if you can understand a situation or understand tendencies you can be such a dramatic you can be such a better player and it doesn't take any talent it just takes a little brain power and concentration you know if you notice you should notice the difference between a fullback who's right behind the quarterback and a fullback who's offset because offenses run different plays in that situ- those situations. Uh, or they're going to run a different play on third and two than they are on third and eight. We need to recognize that stuff. And it's just being observant. So when a young man misses a play by not recognizing uh, a subtle difference in the way the offense is lined up or something along those lines, it just drives me bonkers because I'm sitting here saying, man, you could have had a sack. You could have had an interception. You could have done something incredible if you would have just looked around and paid attention. So that's my, that's one of my, my pet peeves is when guys don't do that. And then my other one is when guys just practice lazy. I can't stand lazy practice. If they're not going to take the right step in practice, there's no chance they're going to do it in a game. Your technique always gets worse from practice to game. And if guys aren't going to practice hard and be or detail-oriented there, they've got no chance of being successful in a game. So when, when I've got to call guys back and say, nope, we've got to do this drill over because so-and-so didn't do it right, it's like, man, why are, we, we should be moving on and getting better at other things. We're wasting time here because you guys won't stay focused on things. And we don't have that very much. You know, It's usually something that younger guys tap, t- uh, typically do a little bit more than older players. But, um, yeah, those are my two pet peeves. And like I said, I learned, and it's something I probably should call my old position coaches and apologize. <laughs> and I'm sure they'd appreciate that. But uh, those two things can just drive me up the wall some days. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they would appreciate a phone call. It's funny how <laughs> things come full circle, right? Yes, yes they do. It's, I'm sure it's just like, you know, I'm you know freshly married and I don't have kids yet, but I know a lot of people that have young kids, and I know their parents tell them, it's like, you're raising yourself. And it's like. Yeah, I got to call my parents and someday I'll have to apologize for all the butthead things I did. So anyway, no doubt. It definitely comes full circle. What area do you think that the Missouri Valley Football Conference is most different now from when you were a player? Hmm. Well, I, I don't know how different it is per se. I, I still think it's the best conference in FCS. I do th- I do still think top to bottom it's the most physical conference. I think it's got a great group of coaches. Um, I I think it's a a battle every single week. I think the Missouri Valley, it doesn't matter who you are or where you're going. If you don't prepare hard, you better be ready to get knocked off because it's going to happen. And and I've lived that both on both sides. Um, so I, I still think we've got a tremendous conference. I have a tremendous amount of respect for all the other football programs in this conference. I absolutely love it just because of the competition, you know, iron sharpens iron and, uh, and those other teams make us better. And if you can get through the Valley and get into the playoffs, you got as good a shot as anybody else in the country because of what you went through in the regular season. Um, but, but otherwise, I think probably the biggest thing that I've noticed is a lot of teams have made dramatic facility improvements. That would probably be the first thing I would say. South Dakota State's got a great new facility. Um, Missouri State's drastically improved some of their facilities. We've drastically improved a lot of our facilities from back when I was a player. You know, coming here, uh, coming to Indiana State in 2011 and 2013, you know, our, our facilities are way better than they were at that time. Um, so I think that arms race of college football of, of programs and universities saying, hey, we want to be good and we want to invest. Um, there's been a lot of money spent in this conference in the past five years. So that's been something that um, I've noticed. I don't know if you've seen anything different or would agree or disagree, but that's been impactful, I think. Yeah, yeah absolutely. The stadiums, uh, South Dakota State Stadium is incredible, and I would put it one of the best in the FCS 
totally mm-hmm. in, in, the, in the big picture. And I'm curious to see, you know, the improvements with the new turf field uh, yep. and then the new lights. Yep. Obviously, you got about a year ago. And, and how are you yep. liking all that so far? So far, it's been absolutely great. The new turf has been awesome. It looks really sharp. That's one of the first things. So, so that's been a tremendous improvement. You know, our president, um, Dr. Curtis, I mean, she came into an all staff meeting and she said, I have a vision for this place. You know, she wants to invest in athletics. She goes, Hey, we own all this land. I want a brand new football stadium. We want a brand new basketball practice facility. We want a brand new training room, weight room, indoor, all this stuff. I mean, she's got a grand vision and it's going to cost a lot of money. And I know she sat in front of all of us coaches and said, I want to go out and get it. Who's with me? And I'm like, I am. I'm <laughs> you know, let's go do it. Let's, let's go get after this thing. Let's, let's make Indiana state incredible and let's go win some football games. So I'm really excited. You know, there's a, there's a problem. I'm sure there's a two year vision, a five year vision, a 10 year vision. Um, hopefully we can make that stuff happen. It'll be really exciting uh, to see where Indiana state goes in the next five, 10 years. Yeah. I'm excited to see Memorial stadium this fall. Uh, especially where we have your opener, your Valley opener, the Thursday night under the lights game should be a lot of fun. Uh, yep. and I was, I was telling you, uh, before we started this off, off camera, I was just in Terre Haute for the outdoor track championships and Good. I was commenting to everyone there just how nice that Gibson track and field complexes because I ran track at Arizona state in college and it's a nicer facility by far than we had at Arizona state when I was in college. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous. And there, they've got that little indoor, the indoor over there that track and baseball use. And we use this winter. Um, no, I agree. It's, it's incredible. And that's where I know, cause Dr. Curtis, that's what she came in and said. She's like, Hey, we've got this great track. Well, great. Now we need a great stadium and now we need a great this. And, and, and our basketball arena is getting updated and I don't, quite know where the money's coming from, but I know we're going to go out and fundraise and we're going to go do some things and raise it. And, uh, and yeah, it's going to be awesome. So I'm with you. It's going to be really exciting. Your wife, Amy is in the LPGA. What is it like being married to a professional golfer? Well, that is a great question. One, everybody asks about it, and I don't mind at all because I love talking about her. First off, she's just incredible, okay? She's the most wonderful woman I've ever met in my life, and I'm incredibly lucky to be married to her. Um, but being married to a pro athlete, it's interesting for me because I go between extremes of being married and she's around, and then she leaves for three weeks, and it's like <laughs> I'm a single bachelor all over again, and I got nobody to hang out with, nobody to tell me when to go to bed. I cook all my own food. So... So that's interesting, going from such extremes. And I'm really thankful that I've got other guys here and, and good friends on our coaching staff to hang out with. Um, but, um, you know, it's a it's a high-pressure deal, and, and there's a lot of money and things like that on the line. And I, I think the biggest thing that I know that her and I both appreciate about each other is just two people supporting each other no matter how things go. She could have a great round or she could have a terrible round, and I know I can just look at her and say, hey, I still love you. Don't worry about it. And <laughs> We can go 0-11, and, and she'll look at me and say, hey, don't worry about it. I still love you. So just having that unconditional love and support, um, just it dramatically helps me, and I know she appreciates it as well. So um, it, it works for us. I don't know how many other people would want to do it, but it works for us. So, But but it's a lot of fun. I love going out and watching her compete. I, I She's an incredible athlete. I love how hard she works at her craft. I love watching her practice and how attention to detail she is. She's taught me a lot just as a coach about how to go about preparing and practicing and handling adversity. Um, so, I, yeah, I think she and all those girls are absolutely incredible. I think the LPGA is a diamond in the rough, so to speak, of they don't have maybe quite the national air time and TV time, but they are incredible athletes, and they need to be on TV more because a lot of people don't realize how incredible these women are. They are great players. Yeah, they're very talented. Amy was a prolific golfer in college at North Dakota State and set all kinds of records. But I had heard you yep. guys didn't start dating until after you left North Dakota State. So, I mean, how aware of her were you when you were an, an athlete at school there? And and then how did you end up getting together? Great question. So first time I heard about Amy Anderson at the time was um, – I was getting recruited and I had just committed to North Dakota state. And I remember some bison fan or something reached out, like had said something online and it was like, we've got the, the, you know, 10th ranked this ninth ranked this number two ranked women's golfer in the country. And I'm like, that's kind of cool. 
very cool. I'll have to meet her in college. And anyway, it ended up being Amy Anderson. And then I think some of the first times I saw her, she used to work security at our men's basketball games. And <laughs> I remember I used to bring my student ID and she would check it and let me come into the to the stadium. So I'll never forget that. I used to see her in the weight room all the time. I don't know who set up the schedule, but it was like the women's golf team and the football team were always lifting together okay. at the same time. So anyway, so I would see her a lot and she just had an incredible reputation. Like one, she was she was in the paper all the time. She was in magazines. You know, she had so much success. She she led the US Open after the first day when she was in college. So her name was always in the paper. So I heard a lot about her. But I know what it impressed me was she just had an incredible reputation on on campus for who she was as a person. Um and, and I, as I got a little older, it was funny. I was actually dating somebody else, and, and thank goodness it didn't work out. And all of a sudden, I'm in Wyoming, and I'm a GA, and I'm single. And, uh, and I forget what it was, but she had just kind of reached out to me um, about something, and we got talking from there. And, uh, and then, yeah, we basically emailed back and forth kind of as pen pals for about four months. And I didn't really <laughs> know where this was going to go. Um, and I don't think she did either. So we were trying to kind of figure out if it was going to work beforehand. And then, uh, I happened to be in Fargo one day and we actually went golfing for our first date and met and we got a chance to talk. And then it was like, okay, let's do this. And then the next time we, we saw each other was I flew out to Portland to go watch one of her tournaments. And, uh, and anyway, so then after that, we'd see each other very rarely. And I went home and I met her parents when she wasn't there. And she flew into Minneapolis to, met, to meet my parents when I wasn't there. And anyway, kind of crazy how it all ended up working out, but, but uh, couldn't be more thankful. So we definitely got a unique story. Absolutely. How do you balance, you know, you, you mentioned the travel schedules, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and I'm sort of in maybe not as an extreme situation as you are, but I always joke that my husband's sort of a football or basketball what when I'm out for, you know, the various yeah. seasons, cause he's, yeah. he's by himself for sometimes weeks at a time too. And yep. so you're super busy with your recruiting and your football schedule. Um, but then obviously she's on a whole different boat because she's not even traveling just domestically. She's sometimes going internationally. So how do you juggle that all? Well, no, that's a great question. And we sit down months and months in advance and we grab her schedule and we grab my schedule and just start comparing them and just say, okay, when can we see each other? Um, like I, I appreciate her so much. She had a week off and she knew I had to go recruiting. So she hopped in the vehicle and she literally sat inside a car all day as I drove around to different schools and she answered emails and read books, but it was the only way we could spend time together. And to her, it was worth it to give up a week of practice or to, to give up certain times where she could be doing whatever to spend time with me. And then when I get vacation, I go watch her play golf. I mean, that's what I do. So I kind of, I've given up my hobbies and she's given up hers. And when we're free, we go cheer the other one on. Um, and I appreciate her so much. And and then we look at it and say, hey, okay, sweetheart, I'm in fall camp. I'm pretty busy. Why don't you go play overseas? Don't worry about it. So we try and mash it up that way so that every one of my off weeks, she plays and I come out and fly out or I fly out or drive up and watch her. And then um, uh, when, when, we've get, when we're in season and I'm here, she takes as many weeks off as possible so she can come back and be as many games as possible. So – Anyway, it's a lot of coordination. I'll just yeah. say that. I'm sure you go through the exact same yeah, thing. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> and, but you're right. I mean, that, that, the distance and the absence makes the, the heart grow fonder, in my opinion. Yes, absolutely. Well, and it, and it makes your time more valuable, and, or, or you appreciate it yeah. so much. I mean, when we spend time together, we're like two hermits. I mean, you can't separate us when she's in town and I'm in town. I, <laughs> I run home from work. I probably drive a little too fast. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, like I said, I'm sure you can speak to that as well. So no doubt you played golf together on your first date. Do you yep. still ever play golf together? Yeah, I actually just played golf yesterday. I shot terrible. I couldn't, I can't chip or putt to save my life at the moment. And I'm fighting, fighting a slice. But, uh, I tell everybody I've got the best equipment to worst golf scores ratio out there. So, <laughs> Um, but, uh, but no, but she's actually given me some good tips. And now that I, instead of being stubborn and trying it my way, when I've actually taken them and applied them, they have worked, believe it or not, you know, who, who would ever guess that? Um, but, uh, but no, I, I, I enjoy going out and playing with her and, uh, just having fun. And, and I appreciate she doesn't get embarrassed that I'm not any good. So it works out well. 
<laughs> I'm sure it's rare that this happens, but do you ever caddy for her? I caddied for her once. And I did such a terrible job that I fired myself. I, I don't know if I'll ever do it again. I uh, So we got married, drove down to Chicago. I worked uh, a camp that all of us coaches were at. And then the Monday after, I, I caddied for her U.S. Open qualifying event. And I, the bag fell over a couple times when I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> I pulled out my cell phone and you can't do that apparently. That's illegal. So I did like four or five things that like, thank goodness no one was there to get me in trouble for. So then after that, I just said, I, you know, I quit. I'm done. I'm just going to sit here and cheer, cheer you on. And she was <laughs> that. So anyway, I've got a horror story and I'm never doing it again. So <laughs> The last question about Amy, you guys always have the, the football golf outing every year. Yep. How much do you recruit her to come play in that? Well, you know, unfortunately it didn't work this year because she had a tournament. But last year she came out and uh, and we were it, we basically did, you know, if you pay 20 bucks on a par five, she would tee off for the group and she oh. would do it from the ladies' tees. So 100 yards up plus her tee shot and all of a sudden you've got a shot at a double eagle, <laughs> you know. If you, if you can chip one in, you've got a shot at a double eagle on a par five. So that was pretty cool. And there were a lot of guys that came out there and were like, okay, okay, she's a lady, she's a golfer, yeah, whatever. And then they watched her hit one, and it was like, holy smokes, she's really good. You know, because all these guys came out thinking like, oh, yeah, I can outdrive her. I'm a guy. I'm big and strong. It's like, you don't have a prayer, buddy. <laughs> It was really cool because all these all these guys, you know, big, strong football players that are really muscled up and just watching her outdrive them by 30, 40 yards was, was a humbling experience, but everybody was really cool about it. They thought it was the coolest thing they'd ever seen. So it was a lot of fun. Um, hopefully next year we can time it out better and she'll be back. But, uh, but, yeah, a lot of guys appreciate it. And it was funny. This year everybody was asking, where is she? Where is she? So <laughs> That's amazing. Grant, last question for you. What is a motto or a, a mindset that you live by? Oh, a motto or mindset. That would be, that's a great question. Um, well, yeah, I would, I would probably, for, for me, I would say, I think that, uh, that Matthew chapter 22, when, uh, when Jesus was talking and, and somebody asked him, you know, what's the greatest commandment? And he said, love the Lord, your God with all your heart, soul, mind. And then, uh, the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And I think that that's something that just as a, uh, as a guy of faith that I try and live by and say, if I can, if I can just love somebody else and serve them any way possible, odds are, odds are, uh, we'll have a great relationship. And, and as a coach, if I can love and serve the players, which then, then odds are they'll be successful. So th I think that would be the, uh, those would definitely be my, uh, words to live by. Coach, I appreciate you taking the time today. And I, Thanks for having me. I know you're getting ready to hit the road here tomorrow to go watch Amy play in a tournament. Yep. Can't wait. No, I'm going to go watch her on Friday. Hopefully she'll make the cut. And uh, yeah, we'll be up in Michigan and Ann Arbor having some fun. Looking forward to seeing you guys this fall uh, in the, the Valley opener. So Absolutely. Thanks, Kelly. We're excited you're going to be there uh, announcing the game for us. That'll be good. If you like what you heard from Grant Olson and our MVFC First and Gold podcast, please take a minute to share, subscribe, and leave a review. Lineupmedia.fm also is home to many other sports podcasts, shows like Chasing Pucks with Panger, Behind the Eight Ball, and Coach Your Brains Out. You can also find us on iTunes and Stitcher. <laughs>